I'm Chris Favre, and I'm the Web Content Manager for CFE Media and Technology. Today, I'm going to discuss the ultra-low voltage motor and motor and drive market with two thought leaders from Interact Analysis, a CFE Media and Technology content partner. We'll discuss the market's growth, its future, and what impact it will have on manufacturers and end users in the short and long term. Now, let me introduce the two thought leaders from Interact Analysis. Blake Griffin is a research manager for Interact Analysis as an expert in automation systems and industrial digitalization. Since joining the company in 2017, he has written and presented on many topics, including motors and drives, hydraulics, and predictive maintenance. Brianna Jackson is a research analyst who has done research on motors and drives and robotics and sustainability since joining Interact Analysis in 2021. Jackson also did a recent interview with CFE Media and Technology in June on the mobile robot component market, which will be linked below if you want to learn more about what's happening in that industry. Welcome, Blake and Brianna, and thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having us, Chris. So uh, I guess we'll start off with this. Uh, you know, just so everybody is familiar with this topic, can you explain or define what an ultra low voltage motor or motor and drive means in terms of uh, terminology? Yeah, sure. Um, so we cover the motor and drive space fairly broadly. Um, we've always historically covered what I would consider like the general purpose motor market, which is 690 volts and less. That's what would be, we would consider the low voltage motor market. Uh, what we're looking at here is a really, really different space. We're looking at motors and drives that are 60 volts and less. Um, there's a couple important reasons for that 60 volt threshold. Uh, one of them is it's an important cutoff point for UL standards. Beneath 60 volts, there's not really as much risk for being electrocuted. <laughs> so there's a lot less red tape in terms of becoming UL certified. Um, the other important characteristic of less than 60 volts is that it includes most of the battery architectures. So 24 volt and 48 volt batteries that are used really heavily uh, in industrial applications, primarily in mobile robotics. Um, that's another important reason why this less than 60 volt threshold exists. So when we're referring to ultra low voltage motor and drives, it refers to motors and drives with an input voltage of 60 and less. Um, now, in your report uh, from last month, you mentioned that double digit growth is projected for this industry over the next several years as demand is increasing. Uh, is it all being fueled by the robotics industry or are there other industries contributing to this uh, double digit growth? Yeah, I think there's um, there's a lot of industries that are growing very quickly um, that are driving growth of these products. Um, it's very hard to overstate how important the mobile robotics sector is, though, for this particular market. Mm -hmm. um, again, it goes back to what I was saying, that they're predominantly 48-volt batteries that are driving these mobile robots. So as we're seeing those adopted really, really quickly, um, the adoption of ultra-low voltage motors is kind of growing in step. Um, and we're seeing that market grow exponentially at the moment. So as a result, the ultra-low voltage motor market is growing exponentially alongside. Um, outside of robotics, there's a couple of other interesting areas that are, that are fueling growth. So roller conveyors is, is a trend that we see in intralogistics, particularly in the warehouse automation uh, space. Um, we are seeing their use uh, effectively double over the course of our forecast period. Uh, that's another strong driver of growth. They're predominantly using 12 volt or, or 24 volt uh, motors to, to drive those roller conveyors. Uh, and then lastly, I would point to packaging machinery. Uh, I find packaging machinery to be a really interesting use case for ultra low voltage motors. Um, there's a real heavy driver towards uh, increasing flexibility in packaging machines because of all the changes that are that, that are coming down the line uh, regarding sustainability in packaging. All these packaging mater materials are really starting to change form and shape and the machines need to be um, flexible enough to compensate for that. So what engineers are doing and machine designers is they're putting a lot more automation into, into these auxiliary functions, these smaller functions that are manipulating uh, whatever's being packaged. Uh, and those are using very small motors, very small actuators. So it's a really good use case for, for these ultra low voltage motors as well. Yeah. And Brianna, from a technology standpoint, have there been any uh, innovations or improvements? I know Blake alluded to a few, but have you noticed any innovations or improvements that are helping fuel this, this industry growth? And if so, what would you say they are? 
Yes, absolutely. From the technology side, when we look at the motors, we're seeing a trend towards the integration of these ultra low voltage motors and drives. And this especially for its applications in mobile robotics, industrial robotics as well, but we see strong growth of this product type in mobile robotics by reducing the footprint of the drive system. So it frees up a lot of space within design, also reduces the need for cabling and kind of reduces uh, bill of materials that way in a lot of mobile robot design. So that that's one way. And from a machinery standpoint, it's just like what Blake is saying, especially within packaging and other warehouse and logistic applications, we're seeing smaller points of actuation due to the flexibility of the need of a variety of product types. So that just means more points of actuation driven by all these ultra low voltage motors. So it does sound like that there is a, a lot of potential for innovation, and we'll touch on some of that uh, a little later on. But I wanted to kind of pivot slightly toward um, the industry uh, as a whole. And Blake, uh, your report had mentioned uh, the market is very fragmented right now, but there's also a lot of uh, potential for growth as well. So with all this growth happening, do you see a uh, consolidation becoming a thing? Um, I think consolidation is probably not the right word um what we see whenever so this market for the area that we looked at so the motors serving mobile robots and and and, and the like um it's growing really really quickly and it's gaining the attention of some of the the larger industrial conglomerates um so we expect to see more acquisitions happen as a mechanism for these larger industrial companies getting into the market. So we saw on the ultra voltage drive side, there was a company called Elmo um, mm -hmm. who produces uh, a lot of these board level drives uh, and a lot of industrial applications. Bosch Rexroth acquired them uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, that was one of the, the largest acquisitions we'd seen in this space. We anticipate to see more of that as, as, uh, as the market progresses and, and companies kind of carve out uh, more of their own expertise uh, in given applications. Um, the mobile robotics sector, again, I think is going to drive a lot of consolidation uh, kind of naturally. Uh, whoever can develop competencies in that sector, um, they're going to start gaining share hand over fist just because of the organic growth that's happening in that in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's a very like OEM, it, it, it is an OEM driven market, um, the relationships that suppliers have with those, those mobile robot providers are going to allow them to grow uh, really, really heavily and 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 g gain share very quickly. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say consolidation is happening uh, like we see in some other markets, but uh, we do expect uh, ac acquisitions to occur as this becomes more of an attractive space for vendors to to. to... Yeah, it, it, that does make sense, uh, particularly as some of these vendors like Bosch, Rexroth, as you mentioned, becoming more versatile and more. Um, you know, horizontal and vertical in some of their business approaches. So that does make sense. So it'll, it will be interesting to see what happens. Brianna, uh, from a more regional standpoint, uh, do you see any like areas like Asia Pacific or North America? Where do you think the biggest growth is going to happen in the next few years, do you think? It's funny that you would say that because it is within North America, the U.S. in particular, and APAC, China in particular, as strong areas of growth within this market. So currently, Europe is the largest uh, region of the ultra low voltage motor market, and that's because of the prevalence of machine builders there. Mm -hmm. But within the U.S., we see the expansion of onshoring and reshoring of manufacturing activities here. So that's a big major driver of growth for this market in the US, as well as the expansion of warehousing and logistics here. In China, the market is being driven heavily by both the mobile robotics sector, as well as the industrial robotics sector. Um, that is the largest market for industrial robots, um, that it's, it's going to remain that way throughout the forecast. and really going to be heavily driven by robotics in, in the APAC region. And those are the two regions that are kind of going to be vying for, for dominance in that space as the forecast goes on. Mm -hmm. So 
And we've already kind of touched on this point already, but it does seem like, Brianna, you know, all this growth is having a positive impact on the mobile robots industry, automotive and more. Um, and I would it seems like all this growth is a positive thing, don't you think? Or, you know, what else do you think could happen in the next several years that could have as far as impact goes? So I can't really speak very much to the automotive side. It's not really an industry that we cover. But within the mobile robotics side, it's kind of what I had said earlier, where you see a strong trend of integration of motors and drives uh, really taking off in that application. And as a lot of these applications and machinery are going to have a lot of need to have a lot of a smaller footprint, um, you will see kind of the adoption of these integrated drives and motor types. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Blake, do you have anything uh, else you wanted to chime in on as far as that goes? Um, no, I think Brianna hit it on the head. It's uh, when we look at the the robotic space, they're really trying to free up as much space within their and their robots as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so any, anything that they can do to eliminate wiring, wire harnesses, all that space that's taken up uh, is is a good thing for the robotics industry. So integrating the motor and drive, we see is there being a, sorry, getting an interrupted call. Uh, we see is it, as it, um, uh, we see it being a, a positive for that industry. Mm -hmm. Apologies, yeah. I got a call mid midway through that answer, it threw me off. <laughs> no, that's fine. All right, so, but, uh, you know, and we've you mentioned like freeing up, you know, space within the robot being a good thing and, um, you know, we, we kind of touched on this before, but, you know, sensors and actuators, what are they doing, you know, and other technologies, what are they doing to help make these, uh, these motors and drives better in terms of performance and efficiency? Yeah, so we come across this more on the general purpose motor side. Um, because these motors are so small, um, there's not as much, I would say, of a, of a need to censor them up and, and make sure their, their life lasts as long as it can, like you see in some of the larger motors. Um, so we don't, we don't see there being as much of a play um, uh, for kind of predictive maintenance within these smaller motors um, as we do in, in some of the larger motors. Um, I mean, that yeah, I think that's the best answer I could give probably. We, we don't see it as much in, in the ultra low voltage motor space. Okay. And, you know, Brianna, you know, all this growth is, you know, great for the industry, but we're still having supply chain issues, you know, in the U.S. and really worldwide. And with all, even with the growth, you know, is, are there, are the supply chain issues stifling what could have been, could be even greater industry growth, do you think? I think so. But there's also a bright side here where, the supply chain is definitely easing up as we speak. Mm -hmm. So just from doing our research between um, between February and August of this year, supplier sentiment definitely brightened as time went on. Um, I would say definitely the drives industry is more heavily impacted from the semiconductor side than the motor industry, but it seems like the, the situation is improving by the day. Well, that is good news, and you know we hadn't really touched on semiconductors, and uh, but you know they have are having an enormous impact, you know, in the U.S., particularly in the U.S. with you know these facilities coming up. So it'll be interesting to see uh, what that what impact that has. Blake, what do you think? Do you have any thoughts on what that might do if as more facilities come online? Yeah, I. Uh, so we constantly hear. So I, I recently. Did a project that worked a lot more closely with machine builders than, than some of the other markets that we cover, um, and it was interesting to hear their perspective because they were saying, you know, we can get all the equipment kind of on time that we need now. We just cannot get controllers and drives uh, because of this lasting semiconductor shortage. Um, but those lead times are beginning to come down. So when we talk to drive suppliers, for instance, uh, their lead times are returning to what I would consider like a normal level. Uh, there was at one point at the height of the supply chain crisis where they were out 20 or excuse me out almost 52 weeks in some cases mm -hmm. um they're now back down to the 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 12 week threshold that is considered normal um so yeah i think it's an indication that 
even the the worst constraint that we've had in the supply chain, which is the semiconductor shortage, uh, is starting to to ease. So we might be kind of at the end of of the really uh, intense supply chain shortages that we've seen for two years. Sure. Um, uh, either of you can answer this question, but uh, one thing we haven't really uh, touched on is. Uh, you know, as these ultra low voltage motors get more sophisticated and powerful, and I suppose this is true for all technologies, but in this particular subset, has there been an effort uh, from what you've seen to make them more energy efficient and sustainable since that seems to be, you know, the watchword of the uh, of the day is sustainability? Yeah, um, we definitely hear more circular economy rhetoric being thrown around. Um, it, it hasn't been as prevalent in conversations in history as it has been today, I would say. So motors, motor, motor vendors are starting to uh, design into their their products the ability to recycle key components. Um, that's definitely new. I think it's a future trend still, but it, it is happening. Um, on the energy efficiency side, uh, there is an inherent need for efficiency with these motors uh, because they're a part of a battery-driven system. So they want to make the battery last as long as possible. I would say for ultra low voltage motors, the energy efficiency probably isn't as important as some of the uh, like more general purpose motors that you hear about. Um, mm -hmm. Only because like a lot of the the applications that they're using, for instance, mobile robotics, uh, even though they're battery driven, they're fairly easy to charge up quickly. Um, so there's not as much incentive there to to make the battery last you know a super long time. Um, yeah unlike like automotive for instance where it's obviously a huge consideration mm -hmm. um so yeah on the energy efficiency side i think it's probably less of a driving force for ultra low voltage motors than it is for traditional motor markets uh but it's important nonetheless yeah brianna do you have anything you wanted to add no i think blake pretty much covered it okay um, so I'll, I'll leave, I'll get you out of here on this question. Uh, I'm asking you to, you know, get out your crystal balls here, but, uh, what do you think the, uh, the ultra low voltage motor motor drive industry will look like beyond the five-year window that you had, uh, in highlighted in your report? What do you see, or what do you think will happen in 2028 and beyond? Well, thank you, uh, Blake and Brianna for joining me today and uh, sharing your thoughts on this uh, this industry. This was uh, very insightful and uh, some really good uh, commentary on where the industry is and where the industry is heading. So thank you very much again for your uh, time today. Thank yeah. you for having us, Chris. Yeah, thanks as always, Chris. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank, thank you. And I'm Chris Favre. I'm the web content manager for CFE Media and Technology. If you enjoyed today's uh, video, we have many other interviews on YouTube and on the websites, uh, controlengineer, control and planengineering.com for you to take a look at. So thank you again for uh, joining us today.